Hello. What follows is a conversation with Audrey Driscoll and Mark Paxson, uh, two indie authors. We discussed a number of aspects related to indie writing, including how we got started as indie authors, what our goals are, what motivates us, and general advice for anyone considering being an indie author. So how do we start? Who wants to go first? Well, we've talked a lot about what I do and how I do things the first couple of times. So I was thinking, just let's start with one of you just to talk about your your journey into writing and publishing, kind of the whys and the wherefores. And I say, let's, sense? I agree. And let's start with Audrey because I'm sure hers is. Yeah, right. here I am fiddling with my light. Okay. Um, I can't see anything, just not. Okay, uh, how did I start? Well, for some reason, like, okay, I've always wanted to write, but somehow I thought you had to do something special before you could, you know, be a writer. So um, anyway, so I didn't do the special thing, and I went through college and became a librarian, and I was working in that uh, profession, and then I read H.P. Lovecraft's Herbert West, Reanimator. And I don't know why, because it's not a really splendidly written story. It's really kind of, um, well, he didn't like it, but I think he didn't like it because it was a serial and he had to keep repeating, you know, the backstory for every uh, section. But anyway, others have kind of run it down. It's over adjectivized and all this other stuff. Mind you, a really popular cult movie has been made of it. I didn't like the movie, but that's beside the point. Anyway, so when I, I tried to track the story down because I thought, well, how bad could it be? So in 1998, I read the story and I thought, you know, this is, I don't know, something about it interested me. And I started putting stuff together. Like I took other parts of Lovecraft's stories like Miskatonic University Library, and of course being a librarian, that appealed to me, and the Necronomicon and all this other stuff. And a story started forming in my brain. So I, that, it took two years. In 2000, I decided, okay, I'll write this down. And I got really obsessed with it and worked on it hard and came up with something I thought was, you know, this is a real novel. And wouldn't it be great if I could get this published? And so the other part of that was not so much making money or even being famous. It was kind of being admitted to that society of writers. And I thought that would be that would happen, like the sign of that happening would be if I got an interview on CBC Radio, that's Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which I'm, well, that's where I get most of my news, right? Not, not TV, radio. So, and there's a couple, you know, you hear authors being interviewed all the time. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool? So I started, I sent out the manuscript and I actually, an agent who I will remain, I won't say who it was, read the whole thing and said nice things about it. I think she said it was weirdly engrossing, which I've always remembered. But there was a big but in the end. She said she didn't think she could sell it because I'm a total unknown and, you know, there you go. That was in 2002, I think. And, you know, I kept writing and I wrote the other novels in the series and I, I actually got a publisher interested at one point. This was a small publisher in Canada and they mostly publish what's called can lit you know, literature, literary works. And mine, my Herbert West books really aren't that. Although they aren't really, see, I guess that's the trouble. They aren't really anything, you know, um, sort of commercially identifiable. So anyway, so the publisher kind of hemmed and hawed and in the end said, well, nice, but no. And so that was pretty well it till about, from about 2005 till 2010, I was kind of in limbo with that. And I, I was coming to realize that if you want to get published, you really have to start when you're young, you know, uh, write a lot of stories, uh, send them out to little magazines and maybe some of the better little magazines. And then you develop this track record and you go to conferences and you meet the right people and you schmooze. And then eventually that might get you um, published. So, and I wasn't going to do that because I don't like stuff like that. I'm a terrible introvert. I like to stay home and just do my own thing. So I thought, okay. And then in 2010, I, I did used to go to meetings, I still do, of the Victoria Writers Society here in the city I live in. And in, at one meeting, we had a guest speaker who had self-published as in ebook form on Smashwords. And she had also managed to get into Amazon. I don't think it was called KDP then. But anyway, at that time, I think in order to get 
to, to use to get into Amazon and publish, you had to have an EIN, you know, yeah. some sort of special tax number in the US. And it was yeah. kind of hard to do. We had to make an extra effort. So I kind of set that aside. But I did go to Smashwords. And that's when I started my blog, 2010. And I did the stuff and did the formatting and published the book and, you know, a few copies sold. And then I did the others and I got good covers for them. That was the only big investment I made monetarily. I, I do my own editing. I do my own formatting. But I did get good covers, you know, professional covers for the, the four books. And that's kind of where I started from. And I, I, think, I, I think it's really good that you can do that because not everybody's going to jump through all those other hoops. And now I think it's even harder to get published traditionally. And even if you do, you don't get a lot of sort of promotion from the publisher. So I think it's good to have these other options and it's become almost respectable. So almost. that's my story. <laughs> almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, almost. I think some people still say, oh, self-publishers, you know, they're all, it's all crap. But I don't think that's true. Yeah. So when you started writing, you, you wanted to get published too? I mean, that was your, your yeah. objective yeah. was if I can write something, I want to publish it. Yeah. Well, with this thing that I wrote, I thought it was good yeah. enough that, yeah. you know, and I guess the other reason was just to get interviewed on CBC. It was to kind of bring put the thing out there and have people read it and react to it and and kind of you know to get at least some sort of recognition that yeah this is that i wasn't deluded thinking it was like a good piece of work did you ever get your interview no <laughs> no okay that's 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 on my list of, of objectives audrey's going to get her interview <laughs> uh, well i don't know <laughs> I'm not sure they're although they I think there are some programs I've heard are I think they're running short of people to interview because they're interviewing yeah. all kinds of people you know bakers and people that make cookies and I don't know people that have gardens I have one of those too but yeah, yeah anyway we'll see I've kind of let that one go I, I you you said a few things that I, I want to keep track of that you know maybe talk about later in this session or in, in another call chat when we talk about some other things, but a couple of them were, one, the agent liked your story but didn't know how to sell it. Mm -hmm. That's something yeah. that I hear so frequently from writers who are trying to find an agent or a publisher is, oh, it, I loved your story, but I don't know how to sell it. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, if they don't, I mean, that's their job. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, 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 I don't understand if they like a story, why, why they can't figure out how to sell it. I think it's because they know the market now and, I, and, yeah. and how, how publishing, like big publishing, especially how it works now and, yeah. and that you, you have to sell vast numbers of copies really fast. Like they're not yeah. going to invest in a book that's going to be, you know, take years or, or even a, a invest in an author. Like maybe their first book won't sell, but I yeah. have faith in this person and, you know, eventually they'll build up momentum. They're, they don't do that anymore. Yeah. It's got to like earn its it's a uh, way right away and yeah. if possible go to the movie and the right. you know the whole right. thing or otherwise it's not worth bothering so the other thing you tough. said the other thing you said was the the part about and i think that this is something that writers need to realize whether they're going traditional or independent publishing or self-publishing or whatever is so much of the marketing and the schmoozing is something the writers got to do they, they yeah. don't get to just write a book and give it to a publisher and then go to write their second book. Mm -hmm. The only way you really, if, if, if your objective is to publish and get a audience, that's more than just, you know, the people who read your blog or follow you on Twitter, mm -hmm. you have to go to conferences, you have to schmooze with people, you have to have a marketing plan and all these other things. And, most publishers or agents aren't really going to do that much for you these days. No, they're not. Which is why I think if, if you're going to be doing that anyway, you might as well self-publish, yeah. right? I mean, you can, you can uh, spend as much or as little as you want on it. You can hire editors. You can hire uh, publicity people, although I'm not sure how much they do. And you can yeah. hire cover designers. And you can do everything the publisher would do. Right. And then you go out and promote it yourself as much yeah. or as little as you're willing to do. Now, if you're not... If you're not a self-promoter like me, you have to dial down your expectations practically to zero for sale. Yeah. And if you're not happy with that, then you might as well forget the whole thing. 
So that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, if yeah. if I sell, let's say, one or two ebooks a month, I'm happy with that. Mm. You know, <laughs> even though my, it's pathetic. Yeah. My yeah. my problem my problem was my first book that I published. Well, my novel, my short story collections never really did much, but the first novel I published was in a genre that's a popular genre. So I actually sold enough to make a couple thousand dollars on it. Well, that was yeah. one night in Bridgeport. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I should buy that. I've been it's been on my to do list. I must buy but, and read that. Book. But that kind of oh well, if I can do that with that one, and this next story is better. Mm -hmm. But then everything I've written since then is more you know literary fiction or like like how you described your first work and some of the other stuff. It's not it's not they don't fit into uh, genres that are popular with readers who read a lot of books mm -hmm. you know yeah. so it just it's it's become much harder to find an audience and find people willing to buy a book from someone an author they've never met when it's not you know they don't have confidence that it fits into the, the legal thriller genre or you know horror or something like that so mm -hmm. yeah that's that's anyway. true um yeah mine is it's not horror and it's it's kind of supernatural but not really you can't really call it totally paranormal and it's my writings are sort of literary but not purely because they have these other elements although margaret atwood can get away with combining right. science fiction elements with the literary thing but then she kind of had made it before she started doing that yeah. sort of mixing yeah. up so i guess that explains that but yeah they're not enough of any one thing to fit into the box yeah. so but you know like i say i've i think i've kind of come to the point where i you know, it, it, it depends what measuring stick you measure me against. And if you pick the standard measuring stick, then yeah, I'm a total failure. And actually, I think most of us are. But if you use a different stick, then, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I think. And I think that that's something that we should talk about at some point about expectations. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty well what I've concluded because your expectations, if you have an expectation of selling a lot or becoming rich or becoming famous, you really have to yep. work at it hard and have the sort of basic qualities of promotion and stuff. If, if yep. you don't have that, then you have to dial down the expectations. Yep. If you don't want to dial the expectations down, then you might as well find something else to do besides writing to get famous. <laughs> okay. Bertolt. Oh, my process. What's your story. Oh, yeah. well, my story uh, strangely also involves H.P. Lovecraft, uh, in the sense that I started reading a lot of his stories and I enjoyed them. At the same time, there was a part of me that was like, "Well, I could do better than that," <laughs> so, which wasn't true. I, I wrote a series of stories, sort of like Lovecraftian-ish. Um, that I look back on and, and are not very good. But uh, nevertheless, I did that and I thought I would self-publish them. And I had enough fun doing it that I started thinking about, oh, what else could I write? And I started thinking, what would I like to read? And started writing things like that. So, and you know, then I just sort of decided, well, I'll keep publishing it because it's kind of fun. It's interesting to see what people think. Mm -hmm. When did I you think start? That's the only reason to write is yeah, it has to be fun. If it becomes a job or a slog or a chore, then you might as well quit. <laughs> when did? How long have you been writing? Um, I think I started. I think I wrote my first one in like 2013, 14. I think it was published 2014. Hmm. Did you write? as a child or in high school or college or? Uh, yes, I actually, when I was like 15, I wrote a sort of epic fantasy comedy novella. Huh. That an, an epic novella. <laughs> no. <laughs> I should clarify that. It, it's like a, a takeoff on the epic fantasy genre. Okay, okay. <laughs> Only condensed into a novella. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> What about you, Audrey? Did you write when you were younger? Or actually, was just... I, I did. I did. Actually, what I did was when I was just a kid, you know, less than 10 or 12 or so, I used to like to 
have like I was really into the Jungle Books, you mm -hmm. know, the Mount Mowgli and Bagheera yeah. and all those guys. And so I had made my friends, and I would act out these little dramas based on that. And I'd kind of be the director, and I don't know. That was kind of weird. But I didn't write things down until I think in high school we had a in one class. I think it was grade nine or something. Like I was about fourteen. We had an assignment to write a novel, just for you know, to see if we could do it. So I uh, and it was supposed to be a joint thing. So I mm. partnered up with a pal in the class, and we actually, I, we, we well, it was mostly me, wrote this thing set in Egypt of all places, <laughs> and it, it was, it was, I think it was probably kind of based on some book I'd read, you know, earlier that was had the same setting, and it was some sort of. Um, um, kind of like a crime thing like there was a bad guy and a good guy and the good guy had to be a bad guy and to tell you the truth I'm kind of hazy on the details but I know that you know we got it done and I think it got like fairly good marks and stuff and it kind of gave me a taste of yeah this is kind of cool but I think in the years after that I sort of lost touch with like I began to think of writing fiction as kind of a you know like a, a thing you know sort of like a priesthood or a you know, an order where you had to somehow be anointed by somebody. And uh, I don't know, I didn't, you know, I kind of thought that's on me, you know, because I went off and did other stuff. So that was kind of it until I met Herbert West. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we're told, um, did you start, when you started writing again more recently, did you start with the idea that you were going to publish what you did or? Uh, no, I actually sort of always planned on just self-publishing. I never thought of going any tradition. But that was part of the plan. You were, Absolutely, you were, yes. Okay. I, I, I plan to, I'm not sure when the idea that I could, I should publish this, it, like condensed in my mind, but I think it was always sort of at the back of my mind that I want to, I want to do something with this. Yeah. So, um, I started writing kind of when you started writing, Audrey, a couple years later, but probably around 2003. And as I've described before, probably in the first video chat that uh, mm -hmm. we had, um, I always wanted to write, but well, no, let me back up. For the first 20 or 25 years of my life, I hated writing. I thought I was a horrible writer. I didn't want to write. I was thrilled when I didn't have to take an English class in college because I wouldn't have to write then. Mm. Um, but some, something happened somewhere around there in my early 20s. My dad is a writer. Um, most of what he wrote, he, he actually got published six or seven books on writing. Um, and he was a technical editor, worked for the state government. So that editing and writing was what he did. And he wrote a, a several novels. He never got them published, but when he finished them, he would have me read them just to provide feedback. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of motivated me to, to think about writing. So then I spent the next 15 years or so uh, wanting to write a novel, but not having a clue how to go about doing it. And, um, you know, I'd come up with these great opening lines or opening scenes, and it's like, okay, now what do I do? What do I do with that? I don't know. So all those great opening lines I came up with between the ages of 25 and 40, they're gone. <laughs> um, but, but then I, I had an idea and I outlined it in my head and I started writing. And I, and I had no, no idea, I mean, other than having seen my dad try to get a, and, his, and he had an agent because of his other books and his agents never, really went anywhere with his novels, which was really kind of disappointing to me. It just seemed very odd. But, you know, watching him go through that experience, you know, maybe in the back of my head, somewhere down the line, but my main objective was just to see if I could do it. Mm -hmm. If I could write yeah, a novel. Yeah, that was part of it for me too. Yeah, and so yeah. I wrote the novel and then I did, I wrote it and then I, it took me a year to write it and then it took me another year to completely rewrite it. And then I, I did send query letters out to some agents and got absolutely nothing. So I just kind of gave up on that and kept writing. And then probably, you know, around 2012, I think is when, I mean, to me, that's when this big self-publishing mm -hmm. thing really started. That's when I became aware of it. And I had written enough short stories to put together a couple of collections. And then I published One Night in Bridgeport and that's, 
that's how I got started. Um, yeah. And I, I uh, I'm still writing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I have, I mean, again, a, a topic for further discussion, at least for me, is what's the objective? Um, do you write just to write? And there are all sorts of people, you know, on blogs and on Twitter who talk about they've been writing since they were three years old and they, they, they couldn't consider life without writing. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if I'm that. I mean, I definitely wasn't writing that far back in my life. And I, but to me, there's, like I said, what's the objective? And I think anybody who thinks about writing needs to come up with some idea of what their objective is. Is it just to write? Is it to publish and get whoever you can to read? Or do you want to write a bestseller? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, it's writing is hard. It like is. It's, it is hard. I mean, it, it's, uh, I don't know if I get, I don't think I ever get writer's block. Like I always know what I want to do, but getting to the point where I actually sit down and do it is getting harder and harder. Because mm -hmm. it seems like it's it's sort of like going out for a long run every day, that kind of thing. Like you know, yeah. it's it's a good thing to do. It's something you want to do. When you when you get it done, it feels good. But actually, getting to the point where you're doing it is really tough. And it's that whole you have an idea, you have um, scenarios, you have sort of a goal you're going toward. But getting making that jump from what's in your head to actually getting it into actual words, that is tough. Now, I was really lucky with the first few books. That whole Herbert West series, I don't know, I, I think I must have had to kind of beaver away at it to some extent, but it seemed like it wrote itself. Yeah. You know, it was just wow. kind of like, I couldn't wait to get back to it every day. <laughs> and I'd be at work and I'd make little notes, you know, during breaks or even to tell the truth, something would occur to me. It was always like going in the back of my head. Something would occur to me and I'd stop working and you know, write down whatever it was and stuff it in the old bag to take home. And then, you know, right after dinner, I hustled down to my basement writing room and, you know, just worked away at it for two or three hours. Whereas now I kind of have to make myself do that. And the, the only way I managed to write She Who Comes Forth in about a year and a half was by declaring to my critique group at the time that I will have some, you know, a new chapter every month. And I didn't want to kind of, like, they wouldn't care really, right? If I didn't turn up with a chapter, those people would say, oh, too bad, and that'd be it. But it would kind of, it would feel like a failure to me. So that's how I was able to do it. I'd crank out that, at least about 7,000 words per chapter every time. And I got her done. But it was tough. Yeah. And yet, if you don't do it, you feel like a failure. Like that to me is the real failure is when you don't get the thing written that wants to be written. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've I've had a uh, uh, five or six years, maybe even more, of major writer's block. Mm -hmm. Particularly compared to what I was doing for the eight or nine years before that. I mean, so I, so what is writer's block for you? Is it when you you know, you sit at the desk there and you're all poised and ready, but the words don't come or what? Well, frequently it's, it's like you were saying, it, I don't even get to the desk. Mm -hmm. But when I do get to the desk, as soon as I write something, my, my, my internal editor says, well, that's crap. What the heck are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? Mm -hmm. and, and there's, th this, is, this is a topic I, I'd like to hold off for another, a larger conversation, because yeah. um, one of the things every once in a while I blog about writer's block, and I would say, you know, the reason today, and I would say it's, you know, reason 53 of the 83 reasons why I have writer's block. There's so many aspects to it for me. It might be completely different for other people, but there were a lot of things going on and a lot of reasons why I just simply couldn't write. Hmm. Or a number of years. Um, the, the good news, at least right now, is, um, I don't know if you saw my blog post, but I, yeah, wrote, I, did. I, yeah. I, I finished writing something, and, and this gets back to what's your objective? And I think part of the, one of the reasons I've been struggling for so long is I don't know what my objective is anymore. 
And when I finished writing part two of The Dime and um, Kevin Brennan uh, read it for me and said, this has commercial appeal. You should, you should try to you know, get an agent for it, but you need to write part three before you. Yeah. And, and somehow, for some reason, that prompted me to write 22,000 words in a little over a month, which is something I haven't done in a long time. Yeah, that's good. So again, objective. That that might be something we all have to have. Maybe some people don't. They just write to write. I don't know. What about you, Burl? Yeah, sometimes. Like there are some stories I'll I'll have an idea. I'll be like, oh, I should do this story. I I, I want to write this out. And then I get there, I maybe write a few chapters and I know where it could go. And then I just think no, I don't care enough, basically. It's like, I, I know what would be involved with turning that into a, a halfway decent story, and I'm just not interested. Uh, what I've come to just do is just say, okay, you know what, I'm just going to give up on that. And once I have something that I feel is really good, I'll know, and I'll just keep working on it, so, sort of like Audrey was talking about, uh, until it's done. Mm -hmm. And that's basically... I, I, it, it may be a sort of laziness, but I'll just sort of say, uh, I'm, I'm not doing that. I, I don't feel inspired enough by it. <laughs> How often do you write? Um, do you write? That's a good question. Like, I usually have a couple of ideas per year that I think could be turned into either a novel or a long short story. But some of those never go anywhere. Some of them I write and I just abandon. Some of them, there are a few things I write and then I just say, I don't want to publish that. Um, mm -hmm. And then what's left is the stuff I do write and publish, which is like five things at this point. Well, four, we call it four things over the space of about three years. So mm -hmm. let's say roughly once per year <laughs> does out of yeah. all that, something that's actually publishable appear. Mm -hmm. I don't know, once I start to actually write something, I usually finish it. And I, up till now anyway, I have in, you know, in the end published it. But, but I think what it is, is I don't actually start writing until I've got enough elements together in my head. And then once, once they're all there, like I need to have a good beginning in mind and I have to know where I'm going. I absolutely have to know what the ending is, at least vaguely, not maybe in detail. And how I get there, of course, is the tough part. And then I kind of make that up as I go along. But I don't actually start writing until I've got enough stuff kind of sitting there to, to, to get it off the ground, as it were. So I don't have sort of partially written things that I've abandoned. So uh, can, can I give you all my half completed works in progress? <laughs> Well, I don't know. They, I, they, they, maybe they, they have to. They have to start here. <laughs> no, I know. So, do you? Do you? You? You describe it as the stuff that's in your head. Do you? Mm -hmm. Do you make a written outline or? Yeah, yeah. I make notes. I make tons okay. of notes. I have this little book here. Okay. It's full of all kinds of little ideas, like even ideas for things I haven't written yet, like story idea, you know, blah blah blah. But that's as far as it'll go until I've sort of decided, okay, let's make this into something. Like right now, I, I made some notes for a sequel to She Who Comes Forth. And, you know, I'm trying to, at first I thought, oh, it would definitely be back in Egypt. But then I thought, why should it be back in Egypt? Maybe it'll happen yeah. in Arkham. We're going back to Arkham, right? <laughs> because Arkham being totally fictitious, I don't have to get right the way you do yeah. Egypt, yeah. which is an actual place that exists. <laughs> because I did a ton of research on that you know, peering at Google Maps and Google Earth and trying to see those places in Luxor. And I think I did a pretty good job of it because there were a couple people who read it who said they thought I'd actually been there. Hmm. And at least one of those folks was somebody who commented on the blog and she actually had been to Egypt. So, you know, I think I did, but it was tough. Like yeah. getting the plot elements plus all that research plus, um, you know, just kind of getting the words down kind of thing. So. So maybe, you know, I, I don't know, I have notes. I have some things that are sort of interesting that come from the other books that I could really work into. And I think, yeah, I could really work with that. But I'm not sure if I've got the sort of main thing that leads to a, 
a good ending. You know, you can't just kind of mess around with things just because I find them sort of interesting. Yeah. There has to be something that a reader would. So I'm not sure and, I've got that. And, so, so, but do you need that before you start writing? Yeah, yeah. You have to have something big that you're aiming for. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think I've got the, although I did think of something where I thought, yeah, this might be it. And I made a note, but I'm not at the point where I'm, you know, going to sit down. And, and it's too bad because winter time is a great time for writing. I mean, that whole NaNoWriMo thing, I've never yeah. done that, but I did, in fact, start writing in November because, so, you know, the garden's not doing anything and yeah. it gets dark early and, you know, there you are. It, it, it was learning about NaNoWriMo that prompted me to outline One Night in Bridgeport in my, in my head on the drive home. Yeah. So, um, Bertolt, what about you? Do you do notes or outlines or? Um... Yes, I do notes and sometimes I'll do outlines, although I think we talked before about how if I'm in the middle of writing something and I want to go a different way than an outline, I'll totally do that. I will just be like, oh, I'm going to take it this way instead. Um, usually, though, most of it's just I have a general idea of where I want to start and where I want to finish and I just sort of write from there. But I've never done anything that's uh, set anywhere like Egypt that would require a huge yeah. amount of research. You, you, you write in, in very clearly fictional worlds so you can kind of make it up as you go. <laughs> exactly. So it's interesting because um, I think when we had our first video chat I told, uh, told you that the twist in One Night in Bridgeport was something that I had no idea what it was until I got there. Hmm. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah, and so, and I was just thinking, the stuff that I'm writing these days, I don't know a lot about what's going on until I start writing. The, the mm -hmm. Dime, it started as a short story that was eight pages long, and it just progressed into something more. And, and as I write, I figure out what's going to happen. And in, in the part that I just finished, there's a twist at the end that didn't, didn't come to me until about two days before I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And like the novella, The Irreparable Past, that just started with an image. And it went from there. And until I wrote the end, I had about three different possible endings of how it might end. Mm. So. Wow. Yeah. I, I am the ultimate pantser. Really? Yeah, I think I'm a partial pantser. Yeah. But, but I always kind of know where I'm headed. It's just a matter of how do I get there. I don't think, I can't, okay, well, yeah, I, some of the stuff in The Friendship of Mortals got influenced by the music I was listening to at the time. That Lorena McKennett song about the um, the Dark Night of the Soul. I don't know if you know Lorena McKenna. She's, I think she's from, she's sort of Canadian, but she's from Ireland originally. And she does sort of um, literary uh, songs, like some, some poems, like The Highwayman, you know that poem, The Highwayman. She's set that to music and, and a bunch of others. Anyway, so The Dark Night of the Soul is this thing by St. John of the Cross. And I have to admit, I've lost the particulars. But she set that to music, and I listened to that when I was writing that book, and I didn't have any intention to have it influence the, how things turned out, but it did in a rather weird way. But then I you've both read the books, so you kind of know what it's about. But yeah, that was sort of an unexpected thing. And then sometimes when you're writing a scene or dialogue or something, something will pop up, and it's almost a surprise. Oh, wow, yeah. look at that. You know, and that's why people say their characters come to life and start directing the way things are going and I don't know. So I, I, I see that I see those I see people say that and I just kinda of, come on. No, you you're in control. Your characters are not in control. <laughs> well I guess they become really real to people. Yeah. It's like no, they're I, real yeah. people and they're yeah, yeah kind of calling the shots. But uh or maybe it's just sort of fun. It is sort of fun. You know, you kind of feel like you're not alone. <laughs> Yeah. There's somebody else here, yeah. and then you kind of owe them something, you know. And that's when you can't you can't just drop a work and walk away because there's these guys like they're frozen, right? Uh, you know, and you have to <laughs> give them life so they can fulfill themselves or whatever. Yeah. 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 So, so Bertolt, do you have characters that 
feel like they've come to life and they're steering the bus? Um, I, I'm going to say no, not generally. I don't, I don't feel that way. I'm trying to think if there's any exception to that. I, certainly there's been times when I'll be writing and my plan in my head is for, you know, A is supposed to happen. And as I'm writing the scene, I think, no, 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 I want to do this instead. I'll do B. And I just go off in that direction. But for me, I don't think of it as like, oh, that's what the character wants to do. It's more like, oh, this is a much better idea than yeah. what I had before. And, and, and don't you think, wow, if I had gone with A, that would have just not been as good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like, why did I think that was a good idea? Yeah, I actually uh, did think about rewriting Friendship of Mortals to make it grittier and less less supernatural and to make Herbert West more of a sort of a, a real shady type. But I never got around to it. And I'm, I'm not sure there's any point really. And I don't think I could do a good job on that. I mean, I'm not Elmore Leonard, so it's yeah. not even go over here. <laughs> well, I the liked story how, is, go ahead. I, I liked how you did write it, how it, it felt, I mean, it felt like something Lovecraft could have written. And I, I mean that in a good way to be clear that mm. it has his, his style to it. Uh, mm -hmm. I really, I really like that about the book. Do either of you have any um, advice to people who are exploring writing and self-publishing? Well, I would say what we've that already talked about. If if the person is young and they're just starting out, then they probably and they. And they don't really want to do the self-publishing and, and do the, do everything themselves, basically, including promotion. And they, you know, might want to give a shot to getting traditionally published. And then you do the right, you know, thing where you send. Mind you, I'm not sure that getting published in a whole bunch of little tiny online magazines is really well. I suppose it, it's a track record in the sense that you're you're willing to send your stuff out and different editors or different people who publish little magazines have found your things to be worthwhile and then you do have to go through a kind of editing process there so you, you can work with so you can do that so i think that's what establishes the track record so you do that you send out stories and enter contests and hopefully they're like reputable contests and not scam things with which yeah. there are some and you kind of build up that track record before you approach an agent or a or a, a publisher and that would take, you know, be prepared for it to take years while you're off earning money in some way, because you're not going to be earning Hopefully. money from your writing ever, maybe, and certainly not at the beginning. So, you know, you could take that route. Otherwise, if you're, if you start, if you discover writing late in life or after you retire or whatever, like that, then you might as well just look at self-publishing and ask yourself how much marketing type stuff you want to do. Like, do you have a real social media presence already? Or do you, what, are you gonna have to establish that? Or can you sell things locally? Like, I mean, I one of the writers here in Victoria that was in one of my critique groups has written um, a series of novels that are set here in, in this city, sort of historical things. And she, instead of going sort of the ebook route, has just gone the paperback route and I think she's gone with one of these hybrid publishers for her latest work. You know, that, that's where you kind of pay someone to do some of the production stuff. And then she's actually gone around to bookstores and because the, the books are, you know, local, uh, I guess they've managed, you know, she's managed to persuade them to sell some of her stuff. Now, I don't know how well she's doing, I have no idea, but that's one approach you can take. And I hear about other people who, who do a lot of public speaking on some topic and they sell books on the side. Now, of course, that kind of thing isn't doing so well these days with the pandemic and all, but there's different ways you can do it. So it just depends what you're capable of. But I really think if you start writing as a sort of means of self-fulfillment, it should not become a big pain. So you just have to kind of steer your course based on what kinds of things you you know, I mean, some of it might be challenging and not, you know, you get out of your comfort zone and all that, but you shouldn't be so far out of your comfort zone most of the time that it causes you torture and suffering. Yeah. So that's my advice. Well, and if you're writing because you think you're going to become rich or famous, you just have to know that about 0. 0.00001% of the writers actually end up that way. 
<laughs> that's true. Yeah. I think if you want to become, you know, rich and well, I don't know about rich and famous, but if you want to become notorious, then you might consider doing something really shocking. Yeah. <laughs> that will get you, oh yeah, that person, and then she's written a book. But that might be dangerous. You might be writing your book from jail, for example. <laughs> and so I, you I don't. Write a, you can write a memoir about that experience. Exactly. Yeah. What about you, Berto? Do you have any? Uh, I'm going to say something that I, I think, I don't know how widely applicable it is, but it was something that young Berthold should have heard and someone should have told him this. Listen to your readers. If your readers say, just pick a random example, your book doesn't have enough description in it. Think about that. They might be on to something. Don't like write another book that doesn't have any description in it also. <laughs> from, from our previous conversations, I know that is not a random example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you've still got, I mean, it's not like you're ancient. I think you're younger than Mark and I, so you've still got years where you can go. You've got plenty of time to catch up to us. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> catch up to us, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know Carrie Rubin's theory that I'm actually a vampire. <laughs> who just <laughs> I, I have that theory about all of you people on the East Coast because you're all up way later than you're supposed to be. <laughs> yes. So my 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 one piece of advice I want to give here is that basically, if you want to be a writer, you need to hang out with other writers. You mentioned Audrey, your critique group. Mm -hmm. um, I've belonged, not, I've never been in a critique group, but I've done uh, writing workshops uh, with uh, one particular person who led these workshops um, once a month for, for years. I've been in other kinds of workshops. I've gone to a couple of um, writing conferences that were very, very valuable. But beyond that, it's also having conversations like what we're having and sharing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is if you're gonna be a writer, you have to be willing to accept criticism. You have to have a thick skin. You have to accept the idea that people are not gonna like, some people are not gonna like what you write. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to give you valuable advice that's gonna hurt. But if you think you're gonna be a writer, just sitting in your, your room with the door closed and voila, it's gonna be a masterpiece and everybody's gonna love it, that's not how it works. And it's really important to have conversations and share your writing with other people and get feedback so that it can be even better than what you think it can be. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're doing here, right? Yeah. Here and now on, on this uh, conversation we're having. And then, you know, critique groups and also blogs. You know, yeah. like uh, sometimes I find in the blogosphere, it's like a really slow motion conversation. I mean, if I can write a blog post, people reply, and then I can reply to them, and it's, and sometimes they reply to each other, which is really cool, you know, when I go back, go to look at the comments, and I find that some of these comments are directed to other comments, and it's, that's really good. So, yeah, I agree with that, totally. And the other thing you just said about slow motion, and earlier you said something about slow growth, the other thing writers need to recognize is that it's, it's the rare the rare creative person who hits the ball out of the park at the very beginning. It takes oh, yeah. a long time. And, and I, you know, there, there are two different stories that I remember reading over the last 20 years or so. One was the outlier, Nicholas Sparks, who writes stories that people mm -hmm. like, I'll just leave it at that. But he, he told a story that when he wrote his first manuscript and sent it to his agent and they shopped it around, he got a million dollar advance. Hmm. first book but then there's the woman who wrote the book the help which became a huge bestseller a movie and all that other stuff and she was that book was rejected something like 47 or 53 times before there was finally an offer to publish it wow that's the more common mm -hmm. happening yeah for sure and especially if and and you know if you're just going to be a self-publisher it's even slower in terms of developing any kind of audience actually communicating with other writers they might be your only your only readers really that's that's how i feel writers. sometimes 
Yeah, I'm kind of seeing do. that, yeah. you know, in the sort of the groups I see in, around blogs. Um, they all read each other's stuff and yeah. I, I, if they like it, they say, you know, write reviews. And if they don't like it, I think sometimes they just don't say anything. Right. You know, about a specific book. And maybe they communicate privately saying, you know, I didn't like it because of X. And that's where you get that criticism you're talking about. And if it comes from a, you know, it's delivered in a positive way and comes from someone you've got some respect for, then it really is something you need to uh, take into account for your next work. So, yeah. 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 Well, I think we figured this one out, haven't we? There you go. <laughs>